Can you hear me? Okay, good afternoon to all of you. Welcome to everyone and a special thank you to those who have come from outside IISC. Uh, this is our fifth installment of the Big Data Talks and we have a great lineup today. Uh, let us welcome our two speakers for today, Professor Chandramurti from the EC department and Professor Narahari from the CSA department. <laughs> I'll introduce Professor Narahari first, our second speaker. Professor Narahari is a professor and the current chair of the CSA department. He will speak today about mechanism design for strategic networks, crowds, and markets. Professor Narahari is a true gem of IAC, as I'm sure anyone who has interacted with him even briefly will attest. He has almost an infinite reserve of patience and sincerity. His research over the last decade has been to explore problems at the interface of computer science and microeconomics. He's interested in game theory, mechanism design, design of auctions, electronic markets, multi-agent systems, and social network research. He's the lead author of a research monograph, Game Theoretic Net Problems in Network Economics and Mechanism Design Solutions. And he has just completed a textbook on game theory brought out by IISC Press and the World Scientific Public Publishing Company. Professor Narahari is a product of IISC, completing his BE, ME, and PhD degrees all here at IISC. He has been a postdoc at the LID Center at MIT. He is a member of the IEEE, Indian National Academy of Sciences, uh, Indian Academy of Sciences, and National Academy of Engineering. In 2010, he also received the JC Bose National Fellowship. Let's again welcome Professor Narahari. <laughs> now for our first speaker will be Professor Chandramurti from the EC department. He will speak about the role of sparse signal recovery in big data analytics. Professor Chandramurti is an associate professor in the EC department. He received his B.Tech from IIT Madras, MS from Purdue University, and PhD from the University of California at San Diego. His uh, research interests are in the areas of cognitive radio, energy harvesting wireless sensors, and MIMO systems with channel state feedback. Professor Murthy is an IEEE senior member and associate editor for the IEEE Signal Processing Letters and is a current member of the IEEE Signal Processing Society Technical Committee. Let's welcome Professor Chandramurthy. Okay. So thank you all for coming. Right off the bat, let me start by uh, saying that I am not a machine learning expert and I am not a data analyst either. So. Uh, so, uh, in fact, I have not written a paper which has the phrase big data in it. And I was thinking about it. I don't even think I've written a paper which has the word big in it. Okay. So, uh, uh, so uh, today I'm going to talk about the role of sparse signal recovery in big data analytics. But what I'm going to talk about is mostly stuff that is known out there, but maybe giving you a little bit of my perspective on it. Also, let me add that since I don't know much about this topic, if you know something about it and you wish to pitch in, you're more than welcome to do so. Please add your comments. You can interrupt me at any time. And also understand that if you find any errors in my slides, it's just me checking whether you're awake or not. And finally, if you have those interesting questions and I say, ah, that's an interesting question, I'll leave it for Professor Narahari after me to answer, you know exactly what I mean. So with that, let me start by asking a question. How many of you are here for the previous uh, big data talk? OK, quite a few of you. But for those of you who weren't here, you missed an excellent lecture by Professor Jayant Haritsa. And one of, the, uh, one of the things he did was to actually debunk a lot of um, myths associated with big data and bring us down to ground in terms of uh, trying to sort of burst the bubble and hype ar around big data. But you know, as they say, um, you should keep your feet on the ground, but your eyes on the stars. So I'm going to sort of, uh, or maybe 
even better yet, given that this is about big data, cloud computing, and so on, it's perhaps more appropriate to say that let's keep our head in the cloud. So with that in, uh, in mind, I'm not going to talk about one hype, that is big data, but rather two hypes, which is big data and sparse signal recovery. So what is big data? It's a little strange to bring up this question at this stage, the fifth in the series of talks. Um, but, and of course, you know, many of you certainly know the answer or one answer, which is big data is data so big that it won't even fit on a single computer, right? Well, I want to give you a slightly different perspective on the, on the answer to this question. And perhaps a different way to look at it is that if you are Gulliver in Lilliput land, everyone else, like the Lilliputs, look very small and you are big data. On the other hand, if you are in Brobding Nag, which is the land of giants, then maybe Gulliver is the small data and everyone else is actually big. So the, an the point I'm trying to make is that you know, what is big data really depends on who you are and that perhaps explains why all of us are in this room today, which is that there is something here for everyone. Okay? And depending on what our goals are and what our problems are, within our little domain we probably have big data problems that we need to reckon against. So some challenges in big data which maybe you know, most of you would resonate with in some form or the other are the, to start with, of course, the sheer volume of the data, which necessarily requires you to think about distributed or parallel algorithms and also deal with security and privacy issues associated with sharing this data across data centers. The second thing perhaps is uh, the fact that massive data sets involve many attributes and require you to use some modeling techniques. For example, in the very first lecture, we talked about uh, johnson linden strauss lemma and how it allows you to take high dimensional data and reduce the dimensionality greatly while preserving the interpoint distances between uh, points in your data set. So uh, this is the modeling and representation aspect and I'm going to talk a little more about that in this presentation. And thirdly, there is real time processing where you're, make, you're required to make split second decisions based on data just as the data is flying by you. And I know nothing about this topic, so I'm not going to say anything more about this. And finally, there is the, 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 the point that data can often be corrupt or incomplete, which need you to come up with robust algorithms that can handle errors or noise and uh, incompleteness in the data. So what is the role of sparsity in all of this? So the way I understand it, there seems to be three ways, uh, three roles that sparsity plays in big data analytics. And uh, so the first, perhaps let me start with the left. So the, the fact that data has, I mean, there's sparse structure in the data. That is to say that in some representation, the data can be represented as a big long vector which has lots of zeros in it. The second aspect is that maybe you can think of data as an image, but this image is not a clean image. There's some corruption in the image. So there may be some occlusion or some other kind of corruption which can be represented as a sparse corruption in the image. These two are related in some way, which I'll refer, which I'll explain a little more in the next slide. And then there is the idea of having sparse data. For example, if you consider the Netflix type of problem, what you have is think of, let's assume that from, from, the, from the start of time, if you think of how many movies have been made by mankind, let's say a, a million movies have been made by humans in all languages put together. And let's say there are a billion people in the world today. So let's say we want to construct a matrix which contains the preferences, the individual preferences of each user or each individual for every possible movie. This is a million by a billion matrix that you need to populate. And perhaps you have observations of a very, very tiny fraction of this matrix. So you may know, you know the individual preferences of about 20 movies of maybe you know, um, 100,000 people. So even though you may have a large amount of data, it's still a minuscule fraction of the actual data that's, that, that you may be really interested in. So that is the idea of sparse data. And this arises in many other scenarios as well. In, in this talk, however, I'm going to focus on sparse structure because that's the only one that I know at least a little bit about. So here's an encompassing model for big data, which is used in many, many studies related to big data, which is that your observed data, Y, can be written as the sum of three terms. The first term is a low rank matrix, which captures the, a low rank structure in the data. And the second is that it is a, is a product of two terms, which is phi and s. Phi is what is called the dictionary. And s here is a sparse matrix. 
and plus noise, which captures everything else, which we don't know how to model. So um, this is an encompassing model because many well-known problems are actually special cases of this model. So for instance, if you neglect this sparse term here, that is your classical principal component analysis. If you neglect the low rank term here, and if this phi matrix is known, then you're looking for a sparse representation of the data. And that is the sparse signal recovery problem, which is the focus of this talk. And finally, if L is 0, but you don't know phi or S, that's the problem which is known as the dictionary learning problem. So I'll give you a couple of examples of how sparsity arises in, in nature. And uh, maybe these are not exactly big data problems. But as I said earlier, depending on your domain of uh, uh, the domain in which you work, these, you may end up considering these as big data problems. So the first is the problem of estimating a wireless channel. So consider that there's a base station which is transmitting a signal to a, to a, to a mobile. And this signal is, this wireless signal, there is a direct path between the base station and the mobile. But there's also the signal that bounces off a nearby building or a vehicle. And so there are multiple paths that arrive at distinct times. So if you plot the impulse response of this channel, it may look something like this. Now, what this means is that signals that go from the base station to the mobile go through a channel that acts as a filter with an impulse response like this. So in order to be able to decode or to recover the data at the mobile station, you need to be able to figure out what the channel is doing to your data, which is the problem of channel estimation. So these channels are, these, due to this multipath, these channels are naturally sparse in the lag domain. This maximum delay spread of the channel is usually very large compared to the number of non-zero taps that are in the channel. And so often you have to sub estimate not only these non-zero coefficients, but also these different lags, which is also perhaps referred to as the support of the channel. And on top of that, since we don't know the data either, you need to estimate both the data as well as the channel. So you don't know what was sent, and you don't know what's, what the channel has done to what was sent. So in that case, it's a joint channel estimation and data detection problem, which may be uh, thought of as a partially unknown dictionary learning problem. Another completely unrelated example is perhaps an air quality control example. So here is an experiment that was done in the city of Cambridge. So this is for uh, pollution monitoring. So these blue dots here are essentially uh, are nit nitrogen dioxide diffusion tubes, which are used to, which are essentially sensors that are used to measure the pollution level at those locations. And they send their data to a command and control site. And what they are doing is to develop an app which can send a query to this database and find out what the current level of pollution at a given location is. And perhaps you're interested in other kinds of analytics, such as how often has the pollution exceeded a certain threshold and so on. So maybe you want to buy a home in Cambridge and you want to know how safe it is to live there in terms of the air quality. So um, you can see that in, in this case also, the data here, the pollution data that is, is potentially, I mean, you can think of it as some kind of a map where there may be some epicenters of pollution, which may be a factory or a highway where there's a lot of vehicles going by generating pollution. And therefore, around these epicenters, there is pollution that's sort of radiating away and decreasing as you get farther away from these epicenters. And so in some representation, the, the map of the pollution in the city may not be a very dense map. And using just a few sensors in this area, you may be able to actually fairly accurately estimate these, uh, the pollution level across the city. Um, so, so these are two simple examples of where um, sparsity may arise in somewhat practical problems. But there are a whole host of other applications, which in the interest of time, I don't want to get into specific details of. But just note that there are applications in classical signal processing or in biomedical signal processing, speech processing, and sparse channel estimation, as I already mentioned. The other thing I want to talk about is a paradigm shift in uh, signal processing that has happened over the past couple of decades, um, a lot of it originating from Stanford University, um, where you know, if you look at traditional data, uh, data acquisition and processing, it's based on Nyquist theorem, which says that in order to uh, be able to perfectly reconstruct a signal, you need to sample it at at least twice the maximum frequency of the signal that you're sampling. Um, and this is typically followed by a data-dependent compression scheme, for example, data, the, the wavelet transform in images. 
this observation that you sample at a, sample the signal at a very high rate and then you do some kind of data dependent compression on it is what prompted Donohoe in 2006, David Donohoe to observe in his paper, I quote, why go to so much effort to acquire all the data when most of what we will get will, will, will be thrown away? Can we not directly measure the part of the signal that will not end up being thrown away? So the answer to this is yes under certain circumstances. So that is the area of sparse signal recovery. And the idea here is that it, is, uh, it suffices to take m measurements of a very large dimensional vector x whose dimension is n, n is much bigger than m, provided you use a, a basis or a, or, a, or a measurement matrix phi which has, a certain, which has certain properties. Um, so, so, so the question is if you have just m measurements of a much larger dimensional uh, vector, when can you recover x from y? And if it's possible, that means that you can store your data using a much lower dimensional subspace or much fewer number of samples than x, than the number of dimensions in x itself. Now, this is just a simple linear equation and the overriding assumption here is that you're making linear measurements. And obviously, if you think, if you just forget about noise for a minute, this problem y equal to phi times x is an underdetermined linear system. And there are infinitely many solutions. So the problem in compressed sensing is to find the x which has the least number of non-zero entries, which is represented as the L0 norm of x subject to y equal to phi x or such that it explains your observations y. In the noisy case, you may relax this strict requirement that y must be explained exactly by phi times x by allowing some margin of error between the two. This is what is known as the L0 norm minimization problem. And it has the problem that it is of combinatorial complexity in the number of dimensions in x, and it is not robust to noise. So this is kind of the point where things stopped a couple of decades ago. But the, there were a couple of interesting breakthroughs that happened recently. And one of them is that this underdetermined system normally has infinitely many solutions, but under certain situations, it has a unique sparse solution. And what is that, that situation? It is if the null space of phi, that is the measurement matrix, has no sparse vectors. So when you think about it, if you give, if you're given y equal to phi times x, clearly if you add any vector, say z, which also lies in the null space of phi, and if you found one solution, you add this z to that solution, that's also a solution to the same system of linear equations. So um, any vector in the null space is also a solution. If you found one sparse solution, and if, if the null space has another sparse vector in it, you can add these two sparse vectors and get yet another sparse solution. So the requirement for not having multiple sparse solutions to the system of linear equations is that the null space of phi must not have any sparse vectors. And what the theory of compressed sensing develops is conditions under which the null space of phi is in some way guaranteed not to have sparse, sparse vectors in it. So, uh, and what is also known is that this uniqueness is guaranteed with high probability. All you need is just one more than the number of non-zero entries in X as the number of observations. So M should just be greater than or equal to K plus one. So when you think about it, it's easy to understand. You need K equations because there are actually K non-zero entries, but you need just one more equation to figure out which of the N entries in X are actually non-zero. So the the, the, the message here is that sparsity, that is if your vector x has a lot of zeros in it, that allows signal compression. And uh, provided, so that allows sub Nyquist sampling or it's often referred to as beyond Nyquist sampling. Can you just say what is m? m is the number of observations, it's the dimension of y. So throughout this talk, m is going to refer to the dimension of your observation y, n is going to refer to the dimension of x, the unknown vector. And k is going to refer to the number of non-zero entries in x. So sparsity allows signal compression if you restrict to sparse signals and you, you sample in an appropriate basis. I don't have the time to explain what an appropriate basis is, but suffice to say that it's a basis that, um, for example, guarantees this, this requirement here. The second breakthrough that came about in compressed sensing is that of relaxation. So the fact that the sparse solution to a system of linear equations in u is unique doesn't make it solvable. In order for it to be solvable, you need to be able to find an algorithm that will enable you to find that sparsest solution. And that breakthrough is the fact that 
by relaxing the problem. So instead of solving the L0 minimization problem, I will solve the following problem. I will find the x whose one norm is as low as possible. By one norm, we simply mean the sum of the magnitudes of the entries in x, which also explains the observations y. Okay. So this itself, just for the moment, let's, uh, let me just say that it's a convex optimization problem. And therefore, it's relatively, uh, relatively much, much easier to solve than the combinatorial optimization problem I showed you earlier. And due to this, um, uh, so this is very much solvable. And what is actually surprising in some ways is that it, the, under certain conditions, this has the same solution as the L0 minimization problem. So you're solving a completely different problem, but there are now well understood conditions under which you will end up with the same solution as the previous problem. And what are those conditions? For example, the measurement matrix must be random and that you need slightly larger number of measurements. Earlier we said that it suffices to have just one more than the number of non-zero entries. That's the number of measurements we need. But now I say that we need m k times log of n over k. So if n is the number of the dimension of x, which is n, is let's say uh, 1,000 times k, then log of n over k is a number like 3 or 4. And so you may need 3k or 4k number of measurements. But with that many number of measurements, you can actually reconstruct, you can get the exact same solution as the L0 minimization problem, but by solving this relaxed problem here. Not only that, it is robust to measurement noise. And so this, um, so there is, a, there is a series of other breakthroughs in compressed sensing that, again, I don't have the time to get into, but there is a lot of work by you know, these authors and several others which have which are beautiful papers which ex expound on the theory of compressed sensing. Okay, so that has really inspired a, a whole host of algorithms for sparse signal recovery, and they can be generally classified into three groups. The first group is sequential recovery algorithms, where you are, what you try to do is you look at your observation and find the column of your phi matrix that is most aligned with your, with your observation and somehow remove the effect of this column from your observation, compute a residual, and then look at which column of your phi the residual is most aligned with, and so on. So these are sequential recovery algorithms where you extract one or a small number of columns of phi in each pass. Um, these are what are known as matching, come under the class of matching pursuit algorithms. A second class of algorithms are joint recovery algorithms. The L1 norm minimization problem I showed you earlier, which is known as basis pursuit is one such algorithm. And um, the other algorithms could be, our, our examples of algorithms are like focus and lasso, which is also known as basis pursuit with denoising. It solves this optimization problem here. But these are all convex optimization problems, uh, except for this focus here. Um, and so the, that's the type of solution you look for. And the third type of algorithm, which I'm going to talk about more in this presentation, is sparse Bayesian learning. So here, what you do is you consider this sparse vector x as a random vector and use a prior distribution on x that promotes sparse solutions. And not only that, you use, uh, uh, you, you, ha you have a parameterized prior and you learn the sparse vector as well as the prior parameters. So in Bayesian learning, we consider, so one example of how you use, how you do Bayesian learning is to consider a general parameterized prior um, in this case, a Gaussian prior of this form. So P of x parameterized by this parameter gamma sub i, so the, this is the ith entry of the vector x, is a Gaussian with variance gamma i. Now, it seems like we've made the problem even more complicated because we didn't know x i's, but now we don't know x i's and we don't know gamma i's. If you knew gamma i's, ext estimating x i's is real easy. All you have to do is to find the conditional mean. And for Gaussian distributions, conditional mean is easy to find. And so it's easy. However, we don't know gamma i's. So what we're going to do is to try and estimate gamma i's from the data itself. And so for that, we're going to maximize this likelihood function. And the, in, in constructing this likelihood function, what I'm looking at is what's the probability of these observations y parameterized by gamma itself. And now we can consider this x here as a hidden variable, and we ma marginalize out the distribution of x. So normally, uh, or rather, one way of doing that is through the expectation maximization algorithm, which consists of two steps, the E step, expectation step, and the maximization step, which are iterated. 
And in the E step, you compute this Q function, or the posterior distribution given gamma of t. And this posterior distribution x, distribution of x given y and gamma of t is simple. It's just a Gaussian distribution with this mean and this covariance matrix. Uh, the formulas are unimportant here. Just all I want to say is that they are easy to compute. And in the M step, we maximize this Q function um, given the posteriors that are gathered in the E step. And uh, once again, by virtue of the fact that we've used this Gaussian prior, finding the, the gamma is actually easy. So it can be done in closed form. So that inspires this algorithm, which is known as the sparse Bayesian learning algorithm for estimating this sparse vector. So as you can see, there's just two steps here. You initialize gamma to anything. Uh, ideally, you don't want to initialize it to um, a matrix which, ha which is already ranked efficient. So you, just, you could initialize it to the identity matrix. And then you compute this mean mu and this covariance matrix sigma. And then you update your gamma. And then you go back and forth between these two steps. So the algorithm itself is really simple. And some things are known about its convergence, not a whole lot. For example, it is known to converge because it's just a property of the EM algorithm. It could take a lot of iterations, but it will converge. And also, it, it, it is also known that the global minimum of this L of gamma occurs, always occurs at, a sparse, at the sparsest solution in the noiseless case. And that, is, that the algorithm will converge to a sparse local optimum no matter where you start from. So it has some, some nice properties. But let me show you, some, you know, a, a toy example and how this performs in the toy example. So what I've done here is to generate a 50 by 100 random matrix A and a sparse vector x0, which has the x-axis here, number of non-zero entries. So for example, at this point here, it has 15 non-zero entries. And I compute y equal to ax0. And I use the algorithm I showed you in the previous slide, plus some three, other, three or four other existing algorithms to solve for x0. And I average the performance over 1,000 trials. And so what I've plotted here on the y-axis is the probability of error in reconstructing x0 from this observations y. Notice that this is an underdetermined linear system. I have only 50 equations and 100 unknowns. But I know that the x is sparse. And I'm not told how many entries are, uh, are non-zero in x. In the example on the top, these non-zero entries are chosen to be unit magnitude, that is plus or minus 1. In the plot on the bottom, they are highly scaled entries. They come from what's known as a Jeffreys prior. So you can see that, so since it's the probability of error, the lower the better. And you can see that this sparse Bayesian learning algorithm actually outperforms some of these other algorithms that are known in the literature, like orthogonal matching pursuit, cosamp, map, or L1 minimization. And in fact, it performs much, much better than the other algorithms, especially when the, when the entries are highly scaled. No noise there is no noise here. That's great. How do you know K? So for the... For the OMP, you need to know K. You, know, you need to know K. But for the other algorithms, you don't. You don't need to know K. Yes, yes. So sparse Bayesian learning. So uh, in this algorithm, it, you just iterate these steps. And uh, what you find is that many of these gammas, the entries in gamma, gamma is going to be a diagonal matrix by construction. And many of those gammas actually go to 0. And so it somehow automatically learns K. So now let's talk about using such an algorithm to learn over a network. So what I have here is a network of L data centers, S1, S2, S3, up to SL. And each node, or node J, has an observation YJ, which comes, out, comes from a linear model like I described to you earlier. And the goal is to reconstruct XJ at node J. So each node is interested in its own vector. And what is known is that these XJs are all sparse. And not only that, they have a common support. That is, for example, uh, just one second. Just to go back over the mm -hmm. slide, how robust is it to the presence of noise? It is robust. I'm not showing the results. I'm not showing the re results here, but it is robust. I'll show you some results a little later. Um, so here, what, what, what we'll assume is that X, Xj's are sparse, and they have a common support. So for example, if the first entry of x1, that is the vector at the first node, is non-zero, then the first entry of the vectors and all the other nodes are likely to be non-zero as well. 
There are two ways, obviously, in which you can try to find these XJs at all of these nodes. The first is centralized processing, which I'm not going to talk about very much, except to say that it is perhaps optimal in some sense, but it is computationally demanding and it doesn't scale well as the number of nodes increases. And uh, of course, this um, is going to be susceptible to failure if the centralized processing node goes down. The alternative, which is very popular today, is distributed or in-network processing where each node computes something locally and exchanges, it, exchanges some messages with its neighboring nodes. So this is secure in the sense that these observations yj's need not be shared across nodes. And it is also robust to node failures because there is no central node that is doing all the processing. And thirdly, no, or, or, or uh, yeah, suppose thirdly, if these phi-j's, the, 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 the matrices using which these projections were computed are different at different nodes, then for, for in order to do centralized processing, you will have to exchange not only these xj's, oops, sorry. You'll have to exchange not only these yj's, but also these phi-j matrices, which are actually very large matrices. So that involves a very large communication overhead. So in order to capture this common support, what we'll do is to model these xj's using a joint prior. So in fact, um, let me just go back for one second and mention one other sort of significant point here which is that this sparse Bayesian learning algorithm uses a Gaussian prior, as you noticed earlier. P of x parameterized by gamma i is actually Gaussian. But in neither of these examples is my sparse vector x being generated using a Gaussian distribution. So it doesn't require the, um, the, 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 the distribution that generated x0. And x0 could even be deterministic and unknown. This modeling is just used for developing the algorithm. It doesn't require that the data be generated from the same model at all. So once again, to capture this uh, joint or this common support, we will model these xj's with a joint prior. That is, there is a common gamma matrix which captures the joint distribution of these xj's. Rather, these xj's are independent across the nodes, but parameterized by the same gamma. So if you were to write down the EM iterations for a centralized algorithm that tries to determine these xj's, it turns out, and I've skipped the details here because it very quickly becomes notationally rather heavy because there are multiple nodes and uh, n-dimensional vectors that you're trying to find at these nodes. And so there's basically three indices that you have to keep track of. So I've skipped the uh, expressions here. But what I want to mention is that this um, this kind of sparse Bayesian learning algorithm can be extended for a centralized, in a centralized setup across, for, for estimating these x vectors across the network. Um, and this, uh, that is what is referred to as the multiple measurement vector framework for sparse Bayesian learning. And uh, what is interesting is that the E step is actually separable. And the reason they're separable is because these xj's are independent given these parameters gammas. And so they can be computed locally at each node. The M step, however, involves such an averaging across the nodes. And this AJ here is some complicated expression that I've simplified for the purposes of this talk. But it involves exactly this thing here, which is this gamma k plus 1 and the k plus 1th iteration is an average across the L nodes of a vector AJ. This step is not separable because you re need to know what are the AJs at the other nodes. So how do you come up with a distributed algorithm? And what I'm going to explain next is actually a very um, uh, sort of popular approach for such problems in, in network processing. And so it, it's the generality of the approach that I would like to emphasize here, not the specific example that I'm going to use to illustrate the approach. So this is a simple but very neat trick, which is to notice that this, cons this is also referred to as a consensus problem, because you want all the nodes to agree upon the average of this L values across the nodes. So this consensus problem is actually equivalent to solving this minimization problem here, where I'm trying to find the gamma that minimizes um, this sum of the mean squared error between gamma and AJ. Yes, please. Sorry, can you remind me what AJ is? So AJs are some vectors that are locally computed at the nodes. So I haven't written down the expression here, but it is of this form here. It is of this form but it's something that you compute locally at each node.
So now since I have many nodes, each node would compute something of that form and now you want to actually average that across the nodes. So these two problems are, are actually equivalent. If you think about it for a second or you can just sort of differentiate this with respect to gamma, you will see that the solution to this problem is exactly this. Now even this doesn't allow you to have a distributed implementation because you still need to sum this up over uh, across the nodes. But for distributed implementation, what you can do is to replace this gamma with a separate gamma j at each node. Now this becomes separable because each node can compute this quantity at its using its own value of gamma j. But you want to force the nodes to agree upon gamma j. So what you do is to introduce a set of bridge nodes. And so you have, a, you have, you already have a network and you use this network, identify a set of nodes and call them bridge nodes. And you can use the gammas at these bridge nodes or you can in, even introduce new variables say gamma i dash which are the bridge variables and these are a set of linear constraints where, which forces these gamma i's to be equal to each other. So these quantities gamma j minus aj square can be computed locally at each node and therefore the objective function is now separable. And a very very hot technique I was at ICASP last month and uh, there's just so many papers talking about this technique to actually optimize this function in a distributed way is that of the alternating direction alternating directions method of multipliers or ADMM. So for those of you who are already familiar with this technique this is going to be very simple but for those of you who are not aware of it it might be useful to know about it. So the general problem is to minimize the sum of two functions f of x and g of y plus g of y with respect to x and y subject to a set of linear constraints and the conditions on these functions f and g can be fairly general think of f as being convex but g can need not even be convex okay so in order to find this a solution to this problem what you do is to construct what is called the augmented lagrangian so this is your normal lagrangian where you consider f of l to be f of x plus g of y plus l, these lagrange multipliers times ax plus by minus c but you add this augmentation term rho times this what this does is it makes this function L rho to be strictly convex in x or y given the other variable. And so that leads to these iterations here xk plus 1. So you alternately optimize this L rho with respect to x keeping y and lambda fixed. Then you op optimize it with respect to y keeping x and lambda fixed. And then you do uh, a dual update step. In the example I showed you earlier this f of x is your sigma f of uh, lambda j minus a j square and in fact the previous example doesn't even have a g. These two problems here are now convex problems and they are easy to solve and it turns out that it, you don't even need to exactly solve them. In, in practice you can actually get away with uh, attempting to solve them for example executing one step of a conjugate gradient descent algorithm. There are many benefits of ADMM and perhaps the most important thing, important benefit is that there are many rigorous conver convergence results that are available but I don't have the time to explain those because it becomes mathematically quite intense. Um, but these, these algorithms facilitate distributed implementations and they are very flexible and you can use them to many other uh, non-separable functions for example the nuclear norm. And uh, this EM algorithm that I've, I've been talking about is actually a, just a special case. It has, it's when you want to do exact inference, but you can also consider approximate inference techniques which are much faster. So uh, there, uh, there is some intuition on how to choose row, but I'm not, in this talk I'm not talking about that. Um, we have some, uh, in, our, in our, we have, so, here is a toy example and this is some part of some work that we've submitted in which we have actually commented on, on, uh, on row and how to choose row a little bit. Uh, but I think the, the last word on it has certainly not been said. Uh, I can discuss that more offline. This is a toy example with eight nodes. Uh, for the left plot, the signal to noise ratio in the observations is taken to be 20 dB. On the right plot, SNR is the x-axis and n is 50. And the number of observations is 15. The sparsity is 10%. That is five of these 50 entries are taken to be non-zero. And what is plotted is the average mean squared error in reconstructing this x vector at each of the nodes and averaged across the nodes um, as a function of the number of iterations. So what is shown is the support aware 
linear minimum mean squared error estimator, as well as uh, the initial algorithm I proposed or showed you, which is the um, centralized scheme, and then its decentralized implementation. And uh, you can see that with just a few, few more number of iterations, the decentralized scheme achieves the same mean squared error as the support aware LMMSC scheme. Also, if you look at it in terms of SNR, the, the scheme actually approaches the performance of the LMMSC scheme as the SNR increases. It's also compared with some other existing technique like the DCS SOMP to show that at lower SNRs or intermediate SNRs, it performs better. I have two other small examples. One is of uh, where we've used sparsity in, um, in, in wireless communications. This, is, this example is in wideband channel estimation. This is the same example as I alluded to earlier. Here we have considered an OFDM system where the goal is to estimate this channel H at the transmitter. So this is a standard OFDM system which involves an IFFT at the transmitter and an FFT at the receiver. And what we have is a data detection, a joint data detection and churn, sparse channel estimation block. And what's interesting here is that this E step nicely splits into um, uh, and, uh, a step where you estimate the um, gamma, which is the parameter gamma or the hyperparameters that I referred to earlier, and the X, this is the data matrix X. And uh, you can see this, this is the mean squared error in estimating this channel H as a function of the signal to noise ratio of this transmission here. And uh, the, the, the performance of our scheme is the pruned EMSPL, that's the best performing scheme, is uh, approaching that of the support aware EM technique and it's, it's significantly better than some other techniques such as basis pursuit. The next example is spectrum cartography. Here the goal is to come up with um, weather maps but for the spatial spectrum usage. So here is a 100 by 100 area where there are three transmitters but the wireless channel is, uh, there is shadowing and path loss and so on and therefore the, 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 the spectrum utilization map looks something like this. And uh, what we have, so as you can see this map here, although it looks like uh, you know, three amoe amoeboid features in there, uh, it still has considerable structure in it. So what we've done is to use sparse recovery techniques to first identify transmitter locations. And then we've exploited the spatial correlate, correlation in the shadowing to reconstruct the shadowing across the area. And so what, you've, what, you've, what is shown on the right here is the, uh, is, the, is, the, is the map that is recovered by our approach. Um, again, I don't have time to go into the details, but uh, this is a, just to show that, you know, even in, this is also related to the pollution example I referred, I mean, I mentioned earlier. So it's to just to show that sparse recovery plays a role in these kind of problems as well. So to summarize, exploiting sparsity can be useful in big data analytics. And uh, I suppose my personal message in this context is that Bayesian method methods are interesting because often they, um, they allow you to have very simple updates and they have promising performance in many applications. There are many interesting challenges in theory algorithms and new applications that uh, will lead to many interesting opportunities and avenues for future work in the area. Thank you very much for your time and thank you for coming. Time for a few questions. Uh, before you ask the question, can you please introduce yourself? My name is Sundar Krishnan, and I just want to know what type of software, math software, you used. Uh, was it Mathematica or MATLAB? Or is it, is it the, the toy examples were all in MATLAB. Oh yeah, all, all the examples here were in MATLAB. Which toolbox? Uh, uh, yeah. yeah. We didn't really, I mean, perhaps uh, some of the functions we've used might have come from the signal processing toolbox, yes. Okay. Chandra, this is a comment on uh, the uh, updates that you have. You had a, you wanted to compute the average. What you set up was a Lyapunov function, uh, which has this minimum at the appropriate point. So if you do gradient descent on that, uh, then what each node has to do is take the neighbor's values and then take an average, and then that's their new value. So does that scheme not apply here directly to get to the converged average value? There are guarantees on the rates at which this will converge and so on. So uh, I was just curious if 
that's not applicable in this context. Uh, so if my understanding is correct, that's what we would do here. So is, is Saurabh, are you here? This is joint work with Saurabh. So Yeah, can you repeat that? Yeah, so uh, uh, in cases where the channel links between the nodes are noisy and messages exchanged are have some uh, additive noise uh, added, added, in those cases, uh, ADMM has a better uh, noise resilience performance and as compared to simple techniques. Also, the convergence rates are better uh, are, are, are better uh, as compared to simple gradient descent uh, techniques. Yes. yes. So, so may I request, <coughs> excuse my Professor? voice. Uh, first of all, it's a beautiful talk. Thank you. Thank you. But I have a qu question, uh, two questions. One is SVL requires K, you said. No, it, right? it doesn't it does require, require K. K. Yes. That gap, those gammas converge. That's right. So, which algorithm requires K? OMP, orthogonal matching pursuit I needs see, okay. to know. Yeah. Okay. The, so the second is mine. How did you get your script? Was it your handwriting or computer generated? <laughs> oh. <laughs> <laughs> it's, a, it's a font called Chalk Duster. Sorry? It, the font is called Chalk Duster. Oh, really? It would be good to know. <laughs> well, thank you. Okay. So please introduce yourself. Um, Arnab from the CSA department. So my question was, is linear measurements the uh, best model for the systems that you talked about? And what do you do if you want to go beyond linear measurements? Um, so I haven't seen a lot of work for uh, specifically on nonlinear measurements. But my understanding is that, um, so for example, if you use what is known as a basis expansion model, so what you do is you consider this n a nonlinear measurement process as a linear measurement, but parameterized using some basis expansion model. And therefore, you can, you can use that to actually explain or to represent nonlinear measurements using a linear measurement setup. But uh, I don't, to be honest, have a very good understanding of that because uh, in my mind, that increases the dimensionality of the unknown vector you're trying to estimate quite tremendously. And so I don't know if that is really the best approach for that for all problems. If somebody else has a comment on that or an answer to that. Are you, are you aware of any literature in the area of control systems where your x comes from the solution of a differential equation, whether linear or nonlinear? Um, so I don't have much experience in control systems, so I'm sorry I don't know the answer to that question. Because we used to solve same similar problems, uh, you know, Kalman filtering and all that, yes. where the x is a solution of x dot equals a x plus u spared space equation. It can be nonlinear. Yes. It can be large scale systems where uh, you have the sparse solutions, okay. sparsity and all that. Right. So what I want to mention is that ADMM is not a new technique. It's been known since 1975. Okay, and as they say, research has a way of rediscovering itself every 30 years. And what we are seeing now is perhaps the second or maybe even third wave of ADMM. So I'm pretty positive that these techniques would have been applied or may have originally been applied in control systems literature. So, <coughs> so time for one last question, please. My name is Vaidhi Subramanian. I left the institute 25 years back. Okay, welcome. Um, okay. It's about application, nothing about math. This kind of sparse technique, can it be used in a situation where you are monitoring data and you are looking for patterns of terrorism or virus scans and things like that? Are, are you familiar with that? That's right. So, um, so again, I can give you a sort of vague answer. Uh, and the answer is that um, this maybe comes in the domain of um, sparse corruption that I was talking about. So that is like outlier identification. Um, and there's a lot of work on that. This talk has nothing to do with that. These techniques have nothing to do with that. 
that requires a different type a class of techniques, but no, this talk has nothing to do with that. Thank you. Thank you for coming. In the interest of time, uh, we will not take any more questions, but I'll request, uh, we can take the questions offline after the talk. But may I request Professor Thomas Koilat, we actually honored to have him here, to give a token of uh, gift to our speaker.